So I've done quite a lot of 3D printer videos now, especially within the miniatures community, and I always get asked very much the same sort of questions. How do I 3D print miniatures? How do I get started? Or people telling me that they've got various problems just getting things to load onto the build plate and actually get their first successful print. Well, this video is intended for all of those people who are just getting started. We're not gonna go through all of the details. I'm just gonna cut to the major points of what you need to do, a step-by-step -step process to get your first successful miniatures off your build plate. So if you're new here, hi, I'm Ross, and this is Fohammer Videos. So here's step one. You need to make sure that your build plate is level. And a lot of people have different methods on how to do this. There's no point beating around the bush. This is the most important point because if you've got an uneven build plate, then you'll get part of models sticking and other parts not sticking. And it's gonna be an absolute nightmare. Really, you want to be following your printer's manual for this because there are a couple of different ways in which you can level a print bed. Now, before you start, the first thing you need to do is remove your vat from the printer area. And then it's a case of putting down a sheet of paper. And a lot of people get hung over. Is it one sheet, two sheets, three sheets? Well, in all honesty, what you're trying to do is just emulate the space that your FEP film has between the build plate and the actual LCD screen. So for me, I tend to take a normal sheet of A4 printer paper, fold it in half and use this on top of the LCD. Now, arguably, there are some printers where two, three, or four sheets does matter because the printers can actually compress those early layers. But please remember this guide is about getting your printer working, not going into all the nuances of specific printers. For those, you really need to join a community for that specific printer to get all of its intricate details. For this next bit, I'll refer you back to your manual again, but you need to loosen off the build plate. And there's normally just one of two ways. They're always with Allen keys and you either have four screws in the corner at the top of your build plate, or you have a single screw which holds the build plate on with a ball joint. But that's normally more common on Elegoo printers of late. After this, it's normally a case of going through the menus on your printer's screen, finding the Z-axis movement option, and then sending the build plate to home. As the build plate moves down, you'll find that it should automatically detect its lowest position thanks to a sensor on the Z rail. When it gets to the lowest position, you should find that the build plate is now sat on top of the paper that you put on top of your LCD. If it hasn't quite reached the paper, you should have the option to lower it further on the same screen where you chose to send it to home. At this point, just press down on the alternating corners of your print bed to make sure there's no wobble and everything sat flush. If there's any wobble, just try lowering it a bit further, but if you can't get it to sit flat, you probably want to be getting in touch with the manufacturer. Sorry about that, it happens. And it's also worth noting that I've assumed here that your printer is sat on both a flat and sturdy surface. If it's not flat, you're going to have problems leveling, and if it's not sturdy, you're going to have problems printing because the whole printer will wobble and slosh resin around throughout the whole printing process. Now at this point, you should have a print bed that neatly grips the paper. It doesn't need to be tight, it doesn't need to be loose so that you've got paper free, but it should be enough that the paper is gripped. You don't need to worry about this too much. A lot of people are asking how much should it grip the paper? Well, so long as it's got some kind of resistance, that's enough. Don't worry about it any more than that. It's fine, crack on. At this point, you just want to tighten your screws. And I want to point out that if you've got the sort of printer where you've got four screws securing the build plate to the Z arm, then what you want to do is do alternating screws and you want to do finger tight and then quarter tight. Otherwise, this can shift the balance of the build plate as you're tightening it up. So start front left, then go rear right, then front right, then rear left or go the other way and start front right. The point is do alternating corners. And as I said before, do it finger tight, then go back and tighten each screw. So you wanna do this in two passes. The final step is now to tell your printer that this is where the starting place is. And you normally have something on this same screen that says Z equals zero and pressing that will set it. And that normally then also raises the build plate out of the way so that you can put your VAT back in. This brings us perfectly onto step two, print something. And I can already see the comments that are gonna be on this video from experienced printers because they're gonna go, hang on a minute, you need to be doing exposure tests first. Well, yeah, you do need to do those, but look, I'm a realist, I understand. You've just got a new 3D printer. You're super excited to see it working. So let's get something printed, but a very specific something. 
You'll probably find with your printer you got a USB drive or an SD card, more commonly a USB drive that plugs into the printer itself. Now the first thing you need to do with these is get it in your computer and copy all of those files onto a spare folder. Because I'll warn you now, the ones that they send with printers, even nowadays, are generally very rubbish and will die very quickly. So get a copy of those files as fast as you can. Now on that USB drive, you'll find you got a sample file. This could be a rook, a ship, a logo, something that the manufacturer has given you to do a test print with. Some of the bigger manufacturers tend to give you some crazy exciting models, but let's just get the most simple thing that you can print that's already sliced on that USB drive, get it in your printer and get it printing. These sample files are normally a little bit overexposed just to ensure that they're successful in a myriad of environments. But the reason I want you to print it here is really this proves that your printer actually works. It's important to do this before we go and add in any intricacies that we can affect, such as exposure settings or printing a certain type of model in the wrong way. We need to know that the printer actually prints a 3D object, and that's what this test should do. Was it a success? Brilliant. Go on to the next step. If not, here's a couple of reasons why it might have gone wrong. One is it could be the resin you're using. Now, most people will get a 3D printer and get the standard resin for that printer. It's normally advertised on the manufacturer's website what they send with it in their bundles. But other people go and do a bit more research and they'll go, well, I want this printer, but I've heard that resin is really great. And if you've got a standard resin, there's no real reason why this print should have failed. But if you've gone with a different resin because you've heard that's better for your particular use case, that could be the reason. If that is the reason and you have got a different resin to what was advertised with the printer, then I don't know, just kind of skip this step and go on to the next one. We should be able to fix it. But otherwise, there is one more reason why your printer may have failed. And the main reason for print failures is temperature. And I didn't believe this at first, but the more I've come to 3D printing and I've gone through several years of it and several seasons, I've noticed just how much of an impact temperature can have on a 3D printer. See, until recently, I, like most of you, have been printing in my garage because it's the safest place to do it. It keeps all the nasty smells out of the house and just in case anything goes wrong, I'm not gonna get mess all over my carpets at home. And the problem with a garage is in the winter months, it can get as cold as it is outside to sub-zero temperatures. Resin, however, has an optimal recommended temperature and it's normally written on the bottle. Not always, but normally. Normally this is somewhere around 20 to 25 degrees Celsius, but that doesn't mean you have to have the printer at that range in order for it to print. You can print at lower temperatures, but there is a drawback. To print at lower temperatures, you normally need to increase your exposure times per layer. However, when you're printing at lower temperatures and you increase the exposure times, your resin can become more brittle. So anywhere from 20 down to 15 degrees, this is normally okay. 15 down to 10, you start getting issues and I've not managed to successfully print less than 10 degrees Celsius. So if you're in an environment where that's the case, that's probably the reason why you can't get anything printing. A couple of options to deal with this issue include getting a grow tent for plants, which you can use as an enclosure when you put a heater inside of it, or you can now get dedicated vat warmers that actually warm your resin to an optimal temperature and keep it there. So if you're not gonna go with something like that, your only choice is to wait until it gets warmer. The next step is getting the optimal exposure times for your printer and your environment. And I'm sorry to break it to you guys, but it's not as simple as going out there and asking people, what are your settings and what are the settings for this printer? Because it really depends on your environment, your temperature, your humidity. So taking somebody else's settings is not gonna give you the same results. It's just gonna give you a starting point to work from. You need to find the correct exposure settings, but thankfully you're watching this video, so I'm gonna make it super simple simple for you. And you also need to take into account the resin that you've chosen, which could be different to the next person's. Now, keeping in mind, this video is about getting you started. You can learn much more later about how to really tweak and dial in the settings for your printer, your resin, and your environment. These two tools are really going to help you with that getting started approach. 
First of all, download the lychee slicer, pronounce it however you want. And in here, you'll be able to add your printer and probably your resin. If you can't find your resin, just go with the default or standard resin from here. And you'll be able to pick from a list of community profiles which you think is best. And it's normally hard to do. Try and go with one that has a high success rate, but also a high volume of successes. Compare this maybe to the next one down in the list and see if they're even that much different. But generally, we're just looking in here for the base exposure time, the exposure time, and the lift speed just as a starter, and that's what we're going to take into the next section. And you also want an exposure test file, and there are numerous ones out there now that do different things, but I always refer back to this one, and specifically this small section of this one. It's all we need. Yes, it's old now, but it's a classic, and it works. The key is knowing how to read it. Now, there's an annoying caveat here, and it's one that I want to point out. I do recommend Lychee for quite a few things, but unfortunately, when it comes to slicing, it has on more than one occasion given me problems just through its own slicing properties and how it works. So when it comes to actually slicing a file, I'll use whatever's bundled with the printer, normally the latest version. So that's normally either Chitubox or any Cubic Photon Workshop. Now, Lychee is great for the community profiles, but what you're gonna need to do is take the settings from that profile and transfer them over to whatever slicer is recommended for your printer. The slicer programs that come on your USB drive have actually been tested with the printer by the manufacturer, and in some cases have a few extra settings that you can't actually get in Lychee until it develops a new version. So go ahead and print this XP Finder file. It shouldn't take more than I think 15 minutes at the most. And you also wanna choose here what layer height you want. For years, 0.05 millimeters has been quite common. And nowadays, 0.02 millimeters is growing in popularity, especially for miniatures. The way I like to choose is normally by having a look at the pixel size of the actual printer. So something like the Sonic Mini 4K, the Mars 3 Pro and the Anycubic 4K, all have 35 micron pixels. So I like to choose 30 microns for my Z-axis layer height. A step up from this with 8K printers like the Anycubic M3 Premium, the Sonic Mighty 8K and the Saturn II all have 28.5 micron pixels. So I'll go down to 20 microns for my printer. Whilst the thinner layers generally give you more detail and less visible layer lines, the drawback of this is the LCD is frequently on for longer and therefore you're going to burn out that component sooner. So you just need to decide what's best for you, detail or longevity. Now, once you've done that and sliced and printed it, you now need to know how to read it. So you need to go to this section, which has got the posts and the holes. If unfortunately this hasn't printed at all, or it's actually ended up stuck to your FEP, then peel it off with a plastic spatula and then increase your base layer time by two or three seconds. But if you're going beyond 30 to nearly 40 seconds, you've definitely gone too far. So actually try going the other way because you could also be over curing it, which is why it's sticking to the FEP and not your build plate. Now back to the posts and holes. This is the simplest way to read your exposures and to get a perfect exposure for your printer, you just want to get an equal number of posts to an equal number of holes. Now, some of these posts are so fine that they can easily break. So what you need to do is just rinse this off by hand and then dab it gently with some paper towel just so you can read it. You don't need to fully cure it, just get it clean. So it's really simple. If you've got more posts than holes, that's overexposing and you need to decrease your exposure time. If it's the opposite and you've got more holes than posts, then you're underexposing and you need to increase your layer time. Just don't go thinking that you can print all 15 posts and get all 15 holes. In some of the best printers I've ever tested, I've still managed to get no more than 13 and at a push, 14 with very specific resins. We're not trying to get this perfect. We're trying to get this to do what your printer, resin and temperature combo can do. So go back to your settings and increase or decrease the exposure as required. I normally start by going 0 0.3, 0 0.4 seconds if I've got like one or two holes missing and then see what that gives me. And then I'll move up or down in 0 0.1 second increments to try and get it so that the number of holes and number of posts match. Even if you've just got the suggestion of a post or the suggestion of a hole, and yes, because of the base exposures, those holes will seal up on the bottom. You can't see through all of them. But once I've got the suggestion of 
13 holes and 13 posts, maybe even 12. That's it, it's done. Move on, stop thinking about it, go to the next section. And I get it, I've felt it myself. Maybe there's a bit of buyer's remorse setting in here, but remember, this is about getting the printer working and printing. It's not about tweaking it to get perfect settings. You can probably, and very much will, improve this by going through more tests later on, but right now, let's just get it printing some cool stuff that we're happy with. Though in saying that, if you really wanna push for the ultimate detail, you could do what I tend to do. One other thing you could pay attention to though is the fins on the bottom. Now, if you're printing miniatures, these will indicate how your finer details print. So some of those thin ones will naturally pull away when you reduce the exposure time. You can compensate for this by increasing the exposure time, but you'll notice on the other side of this section, the cost of that is losing a bit of recess detail. Personally, I do tend to go up just a bit to try and capture more of those finer details at the cost of more recess detail, but you can hardly tell on the miniature to be honest. Now we're on to the next step, which is really cool because now we get to print some really fun stuff. And I'm going to focus on miniatures because, well, this is a miniatures channel, but honestly, even if you're not a miniatures printer yourself, if you can get miniatures right because of the level of detail that you can get out of miniatures, if they print well, you can print anything else easily. Now you've probably already got something in mind that you want to print, but hold on, wait a minute, we need to fully confirm that this printer is capable of printing really good detailed miniatures. And one of the biggest problems with any 3D print is support. So big in fact that I'm gonna cover that in a separate video. But for right now, we wanna take something that's pre-supported and get that printed. And you may have something that's pre-supported, but I have to call out here that pre-supported and well-supported does not mean the same thing. I've had pre-supported parts from huge companies and the supports are actually terrible. So I recommend you get models from One Page Rules. And yes, One Page Rules sells huge armies of figures, but they actually also do some free samples on Colts 3D, all at the price of zero, which is really, really great because these are models from their army collections. They're just giving them you free as samples. And they all come in their pre-configured poses, both supported and unsupported. And I can fully vouch for these models because each one not only has pre-supports, but it also has fully engineered supports to make sure that you can just pop it off the supports and get a model down on the tabletop as fast as possible. Another brand you can check out if you like Final Fantasy-esque miniatures is the Lion's Tower, who makes a huge Kingdoms of Talarius range, and these are some of the best supported models I have ever seen in my entire life. So if you've managed to get this to print, well done. You've got your printer set up, you've got the correct exposure settings, and you've got a miniature printing on your build plate. You know that this printer prints miniatures and you don't have to worry about that. Now we can go into making changes and printing the things that we want to print, but this is where things can start to go a little bit awry. So the final step is go and print things. Print the stuff that you want to print. You've probably got things sat there in preparation for your printer arriving that you want to get off the build plate ASAP. Now you may have problems here, things not adhering, things not sticking, but at this point, if you've managed to get the model printed from earlier, then you can assume that this is normally down to support because everything else we've proved, it works. I'm gonna share my video on how I support models, and yes, this is cheating again. I use auto supports, even though most people say don't, but I'll show you how I apply them to make sure I get the best detail from a model and still get a successful print every single time. But until you've figured out how the supporting works on models, then try and stick with pre-supported stuff because most of that'll work. In the meantime, while things are printing, maybe join some communities. Most manufacturers have dedicated Facebook or Reddit groups specifically for a printer or at least the range of printers that you've got. So go and join there and ask some of the other users if they've had a similar experience to you on what they've done to fix it. And hopefully this video helps those communities out from getting the same post every day, which says this won't print or it's stuck to the FEP. Because if you've followed this guide, you shouldn't be having any of that. And if you are, then hopefully I've explained to you why it's happening and what you can do to correct it. If you did find this video helpful, please let me know down in the comments. And if there's anything else you'd like me to cover or help with, then let me know because I do read all the comments, even if I don't get a chance to reply. And I'll try and make some more content that you want in the future. 
But from me, here's a huge thanks from watching and a bigger thanks to our patrons who are supporting us and help us make content like this. If you want to get in on that, the links are down below to our patron channel and you can get your name up in the credits like these guys because it's thanks to them that this video even exists. You can still help me out by clicking that like button or subscribe or both and hit the notification bell. Until I see you guys again, bye bye for now, Fohama out.